Our next presentation is um, uh, going to be on a topic with a little, little if any, controversy. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, Dr. Majid Shafiq will be presenting cryobiopsy for ILD diagnosis. Is it time for a sea change? Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here. I completely agree with you. Of course, absolutely no controversy whatsoever. Um, how do I advance this? Just uh, that one. Okay, so I have no relevant disclosures. So here's an outline of what we'll talk about today. First, let's look at the current uh, landscape of ILD diagnosis and whether and why cryobiopsy might even potentially have a role to play, right? Then we'll delve into the current data for and against cryobiopsy in 2019. Um, and then finally, we'll try to come up with a verdict on whether or not we should even pursue this. So how do we diagnose ILDs in 2019? You all know this, but in one word, it's a multi-D thing, right? So you look at the clinical picture, you look at your CAT scans, and sometimes that's all that you need. At times, you need to take the aid of blood tests, and in as many as about a third of patients, tissue is the issue. So you do need some kind of a biopsy done as well. Um, the conventional methods are um, you know, a bronchoscopic biopsy using forceps, small bites, um, the gold standard, so to say, or the nuclear option, is the surgical lung biopsy, right? Um, and then cryobiopsy, which also entails uh, the bronchoscopy, uh, falls somewhere in between in terms of degree of invasiveness. So why should we even potentially consider cryobiopsy? It's because the conventional tools are far from perfect. If you look at the regular bronchoscopic biopsy, it's low risk, but low reward, right? So in about 20 to 30% of cases, you may get some kind of a diagnostic yield, um, but the safety profile is terrific. Um, very few patients will get a pneumothorax, fewer will need a chest tube for that, and very few will have um, bleeding that is severe enough to be of lasting consequence. On the other hand, for surgical biopsy, it's high risk, high reward. So the diagnostic yields great. Many studies coded at around 95%. Uh, but everybody is getting hospitalized. By definition, everybody gets a pneumothorax. Everybody comes out with one or more chest tubes. The 30-day mortality is an impressive 2.5%. Um, and then even within the index hospitalization, as many as one in six patients may die um, if they happened to be non-elective cases. So what would an ideal lung biopsy tool look like? Ideally, it would be minimally invasive and inexpensive, right? It would still get us large biopsy specimens uh, with minimal or no crush artifact. That's a known issue with those forceps biopsies. It'll allow us to sample multiple sites because of the known spatial heterogeneity that comes with IPF. And hopefully its safety profile would be similar to that of the regular conventional bronchoscopy. So with that in mind, let's examine what cryobiopsy has to offer. So first, what's the diagnostic yield? Now, this is a recently published meta-analysis of over two dozen studies uh, with a fair degree of heterogeneity, mind you, uh, that came up with a pooled diagnostic yield of about 70% or so. So clearly much better than what you get with the regular bronchoscopic biopsy. Perhaps not as impressive as the 95% that we're used to coding with surgical biopsy. Is there any head-to-head -head data between the diagnostic yield of cryobiopsy versus surgical biopsy? There's one study published in the Blue Journal that you might be aware of um, earlier this year that um, generated a lot of controversy. Uh, this was a very small study, only looking at 21 patients. The study was not powered for any outcomes. And what they did was, you know, in folks undergoing a surgical biopsy of two lobes, they also underwent um, cryobiopsy of those same two lobes. And they found that the histopathologic agreement um, as assessed by a single blinded pathologist was only 
the authors concluded that cryobiopsy, even though it was very safe for these 21 patients, doesn't seem to hold up against surgical biopsy. There were issues in addition to their, you know, their, uh, the low sample size. Uh, there was, uh, the gold standard was histopathologic agreement, not looking at the overall multi-D diagnosis and so on. Uh, but generated a lot of press nonetheless. Now, the cold ice is another study that actually followed a similar uh, methodology, but this one, it was conducted in a multi-center fashion across nine centers in Australia. And it was powered um, at, uh, at 65 patients. They were, they were able to get those 65 patients. And here, the histopathologic agreement between cryobiopsy and surgery wasn't perfect, but it was much higher at about 70% or so. There are no head-to-head -head trials, so we need to keep that in mind. To date, I'm not aware of even any um, currently being enrolled head-to-head -head trials going on. This is another study that I think is worth looking at as well. It's from a couple of years ago, also in the Blue Journal, um, that tried to examine whether cryobiopsy, um, just like surgery, adds independent incremental value to a multidisciplinary diagnosis of IPF. So here, a bunch of experts, clinicians, radiologists, pathologists were all provided sequentially uh, multiple layers of data, right? So clinical and radiological only, then BL data, then biopsy data without telling them what the source of the biopsy was, whether it was cryobiopsy or surgical biopsy. And you'll see here that the proportion of IPF patients for whom the multi-D group was able to reach a diagnosis of IPF with self-assessed high confidence doubled after any kind of biopsy. There was no difference between surgical biopsy and cryobiopsy, suggesting that perhaps cryobiopsy can match surgical biopsy in terms of adding incremental value to a multi-D team. Okay, fair enough, but let's also look at the complication profile of cryobiopsy. So in this meta-analysis published earlier this year that I coded earlier as well, they put the pooled incidence of pneumothorax down at just under 10%. Now, this is all pneumothoraces, including those for which you do not require a chest tube. I would say as a, uh, as a bronchoscopist, as a pulmonologist, when I look at that, um, I'm heartened. But then you look at bleeding, which was always the bigger concern to begin with. As you're yanking out a piece of frozen tissue, are you going to rupture simultaneously a big blood vessel as well and lead to significant bleeding? So you can see that these studies that were pooled to come up with a um, sort of a pooled incidence of bleeding are very varied. Um, you know, they're all over the map. But um, nonetheless, with that uh, caveat, the overall incidence of bleeding is, has been put down at about 14% or so. That's not horrible, but it's still quite concerning to me. Um, and also, different studies define bleeding in different fashions. So I think as uh, pulmonologists, as part of the ILD multi-D team, as proceduralists such as myself, um, I continue to remain a little bit concerned about the association of bleeding with the cryobiopsy. Now, another thing that just got published two, two weeks ago out of Vanderbilt also causes a little bit of concern, um, although I'll try to editorialize it a little bit as well. So Vanderbilt is a, you know, clearly a center of excellence when it comes to cryobiopsy. They have done more than most, if not all, centers in the U.S., and they recently published their data on over six years' worth of all cryobiopsies done for diagnostic eval of ILD, about 180 patients total. The 30-day mortality was 2.3%, and it went up to 2.8% uh, over the 90-day period. Remember, I had coded earlier from a large European database that surgical 30-day mortality is also around 2.5%. So this is very concerning. Uh, they did try to look into the risk factors related to mortality, and they mentioned, you know, inpatient status and really poor lung function, particularly a DLCU of less than 
Um, but I will add, I think it's important to note that this is data over a six-year period. And the authors do mention some of the institutional protocol changes that have come up ever since they had some of the mortalities earlier on. So now they do certain things they weren't doing for some of these patients who passed away. Now they're no longer offering cryobiopsy to inpatients or patients with a very rapid decline. Now they are making the patients hold any and all antiplatelet agents, anticoagulants, herbal medications, vitamins, you name it. And they're also always using a bronchial blocker, which is what I some, uh, personally always use as well to make sure that any bleeding can be promptly contained. Another problem with cryobiopsy is that depending on which center you end up at, cryobiopsy means completely different things. And at the risk of exaggerating, I'll mention you know, three of those problems. One, bronchoscopists can't agree on how to do it, whether or not to use a rigid bronchoscope, for example, which is something I do use whether to use fluoroscopy, what size of probe to use, how long to freeze the lung for, how many biopsies, where to get them from, etc. Pathologists also don't seem to agree on whether or not this much smaller cryobiopsy specimen, which by the way is much larger than a regular bronchoscopic biopsy, but nonetheless much smaller than a surgical wedge biopsy, is it good enough to call UIP on? So if you're going to be introducing cryobiopsy at your institution, you need to make sure the pathologist will look at it and be able to call UIP on it. And then there's a controversy about whether or not to even pursue cryobiopsy to begin with among ILD experts and ILD teams. And if so, what should the patient selection criterion be? So I was asked to present on whether it's time for a sea change. I think the question is, is it time for a sea change or is it time to completely bury cryobiopsy? Personally, I would say it's neither. We need to proceed with caution in a systematic and an unbiased manner. And here's what I would propose. One, we only offer this at centers with clinical and procedural experience and expertise and also with the relevant pathology expertise or you send your samples to another place where they can confidently read those specimens. We need to choose our patients wisely, and I would definitely avoid it among inpatients. That's my practice. We need to have a prospective multi-center registry so we can accurately and honestly follow the outcomes across centers. We certainly need more research to identify those procedural techniques that really impact yield and or safety so we know what we're dealing with. And finally, as always, we need to explore and continue to explore minimally invasive alternatives, including, for example, the Invisia classifier, the genomic classifier that you can use on those simpler, safer transbronchial biopsies as well. So I'll stop here. I think we're going to do questions at the end. My email address is over here as well in case you needed to reach out to me for more questions. Thank you.